I'll just um, say a bit of words of the program today, but before I think it's important to mention that today it's a, or yesterday actually, it was the 25 years after the Dayton Agreement, a peace agreement, a decade, the 90s, in which uh, uh, the Western Balkans was on our lips uh, all over Europe. Uh, and I think it's time to put the Western Balkans on our lips again uh, and um, to discuss how uh, the Western Balkans uh, will uh, be engaged in, 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 a, in, in, in the EU for the future. And that's why we're hosting this seminar today. Um, at this seminar, we'll explore both the demand and the supply side of the EU approximation process, and also for those who are wanting to become candidate members to the EU, the Northern Macedonia and Albania. Um, and uh, we are really, really honored uh, to have Deputy Prime Minister for uh, European Integration Repub of the Republic of North Macedonia, um, Nikola Dimitrov, to speak. Uh, he will be presenting a keynote speech here. Um, and uh, he was appointed a distinguished fellow of the Hague Institute for Global Justice. Uh, and he's an expert on Balkan issues and foreign and security policy. Um, after this, we'll have a Q&A. Uh, and then Florian Bieber, a professor at Southeast European uh, History and Politics and director of the Center for Southeast European Studies at the University of Graz and coordinator for DPAC, will present his panel, which will be Jovana Marovic, Marko Kmezic, and Tena Prelic. Uh, and he will present each of them and, and, and their biographies. But here we'll discuss the issue of state capture, democracy, and EU requirements. Uh, and then we'll have the, uh, a, another session, which is on demand for democracy. So what is the demand actually in the Western Balkans for democracy, for the values of the EU? And here we'll have uh, Veteran Zijic, Austrian Institute for International Affairs. Um, and uh, he will also have a, a group of panel, panelists in which we will have Jelena Vasilievich, Luka Rakicevic, and Dobrica Veselinovic, and Arianic Kafiri. And they're activists and uh, also uh, from the Institute of Philosophy. The last panel, which might be a bit disturbed by um, the, the political turmoil at um, the um, in the at, in Denmark at the moment, but uh, hopefully not. We'll have uh, Michael Oskar Jensen, who is a member of the Danish Parliament for the Liberal Party, um, and he's also the foreign policy spokesperson for uh, the Liberal Party. And then we'll have um, Morten Messerschmidt, who is the uh, EU uh, spokesperson for uh, the Danish People's Party, and Katarina Amnesfeld, who is the EU uh, and foreign policy member of uh, the Conservative Party. And they'll be discussing with uh, Christian Axbord Nielsen, who is a specialist on the, the Western Balkans and at the history of, uh, uh, at the Institute for History at the Aarhus University. And I'll be moderating. But just to now I'm taking you through the program, I hope you will stay tuned, you will stay in with us today. But before going on to our keynote speaker, I'll give the words to Alexander Tomanovich from the European Funds for the Balkan. Please. Thank you, Charlotte. Um, thank you very much, everybody, for being with us today. And also a big welcome uh, on behalf of the European Fund for the Balkans and also on behalf of the Balkans in Europe Policy Advisory Group. Uh, Alessandra, you need to unmute. Don't hear me. I'm unmuted, but do you hear me better now? I'm unmuted. <laughs> okay, whenever we have events on enlargement lately, we always start that enlargement is in deep crisis and that it's not delivering and it's not working. But I think that at this point, we are really at a different stage because now if we don't see major changes in December, I think that we can say that the enlargement policy is dead. And even if there are many that oppose the process, I don't think that anybody should be happy about the point where we are now. 
because the region of the Western Balkans stays where it is. Um, it's almost at the heart of Europe. It's surrounded by EU member states. And looking at North Macedonia, I think one could start adding that it's unfortunately surrounded by EU member states. Critics of enlargement often play with fear, with prejudices, with uh, corruption issues that we face here. It's true, but nothing of it is invented or exclusively to be found in the Western Balkans. Corruption is almost found everywhere and it's a basic human flaw. The difference is in institutions. And that is why we need the enlargement process. The enlargement process has the promise to strengthen institutions, to reform societies. Um, and that is why we need the support of the EU, of the EU institutions and its member states. But what we are facing instead, although state capture has been mentioned many times, even by official documents of the EU, we see that certain political families choose to ignore these facts and just go for um, open support to their political people in power. And it's nothing to do with ideology. The EPP is supporting the current government of Serbia unconditionally, and so is the SND um, in doing in Albania. Um, meanwhile, uh, we face everything what has been mentioned, weak institutions, state capture, and, and no concrete results and output. But citizens are expecting more. They're still expecting more. Um, and the EU should finally remember that it still claims that its enlargement policy is a successful transformative mechanism and part of its successful soft power. The EU, and especially the current commission, claims to be a geopolitical one and uh, pretends to be a global player. I would say that this entitlement should start on its very own continent. Um, talking about economy, that's uh, always very easy and that's a clear facts and figures. Um, in the last 10 years, as Dusan Relic from the German SWP cal calculated, the trade deficit between the Western Balkans and the EU was over 10 billion euros on the account of the Western Balkans. So my first semester international economic relations taught me that for this kind of imbalance to be sustainable in the free trade world, you need compensation. And IPA, that is always cited as the big support the EU is giving, was neither designed for that, nor would that be enough. And to finish, I think that the people of the Western Balkans can help remember the EU, and especially those skeptical about the EU, what uh, the EU is about. First, that we still have that enthusiasm here, and second, we can help you remember that the EU initially was a peace project. I will stop here. I'm sure that one or the other things will be touched upon uh, later during the day. Thank you very much for being with us today. And uh, Charlotte, back to you. Thank you, uh, Alexandra. And I will now um, pass on the word to uh, uh, the Deputy State Minister, um, uh, Nikola um, Dimitrov. Please, and thank you for joining us today. It's uh, fantastic to see you, and we're really excited that you took your time to, to, to join us today. So, uh, and there will be Q&A afterwards, uh, so I hope that that's okay. Okay. Well, first of all, um, I'm very pleased and honored to have this opportunity. I'd like to thank the co-organizers, the Danish, the Danish Foreign Policy Society, uh, my old friends from BIPAC and the European Fund for the Balkans. The timing is somewhat tricky for me because we had a, a failure to reach consensus on the start of the accession talks for North Macedonia two days ago at the General Affairs Council, but maybe that makes this actually timely to be a bit more open. I'm also intrigued and inspired by the title of this uh, introduction, introductory words, what is Europe? And I'll try to um, put uh, a Balkan perspective on, on this uh, question. What is Europe from the perspective of the Western Balkans? Now, um, given that we are virtually in Copenhagen, 
uh, I think I should probably uh, start, and we know that Denmark has not been particularly enthusiastic about enlargement in the last years. So I think I should offer arguments uh, to the Danish foreign policy makers on why it is uh, very important for the member states of the European Union to have this region encircled by member states uh, Europeanized. Why both the region and the rest of Europe will be better off if we have countries in the region who are uh, functional democracies governed by the rule of law, where the air is clean, where the rivers and the lakes are, are clean, and where uh, their economies can compete and take part in the uh, common market of, of the Union. Um, migration has been a big debate in many uh, countries of Europe. It, to some extent, uh, it, it changed the political landscape uh, throughout Europe. And as we, as we all know, the Balkan route was very much central to this debate. If you go back to 2015 and 2016. So one strong argument in favor of a stronger engagement between the EU and our region is the geographic argument. We are a region surrounded, encircled by member states. And uh, this makes us, as the migration challenge showed, very much an integral part of the European internal security. This also goes to another challenge, which is uh, fight against terrorism. The, the fact of our geography makes us indispensable. And the more cooperation there is, the more our policies are aligned with the policies of the EU member states, uh, Europe will be uh, better off. Another argument is the economic one. Our region is um, underdeveloped compared to the rest of, of Europe. And this makes us an untapped potential. As Dusan Relic was mentioned, there is a, an immense trade deficit of billions of euros uh, on the account of, of the Western Balkans. Uh, in terms of trade relations, the region um, trades mostly with uh, European countries. Over three quarters of the trade of the region is with the European Union. And similarly, about three quarters of the foreign direct investment come from uh, companies, with companies from uh, EU member states. This makes us uh, in the same boat that we share the destiny of, of Europe. Um, we are also a source of migration, mostly legal migration, because the hope for prosperity, the hope for uh, those who are well-trained and educated um, is that if we cannot have a European way of life at home, we will move our families to a member state where we can have a European way of life. So in this sense, the region is in a race against time. Those who are uh, required, needed, to carry the transformation of their countries, often decide to go uh, get a work permit in Germany or Italy or in another uh, EU member state. And we don't have their talents uh, at home. So there is a sense of urgency in, in this process. So I think the basic questions to Danish politicians is, um, is it better for Denmark and for the European Union to have this region left alone, sort of a non-EU island, a gray zone, surrounded by the blue with yellow stars member states of the Union, that uh, emanates, that creates issues because institutions are weak, so issues of weak governance, issues of um, 
uh, authoritarian or semi-authoritarian uh, strongmen, or Europe is better off if there is a process where institutions are made stronger, uh, corruption is fought, media are free, parliamentary democracy is functional, uh, and uh, citizens are awake and active. So um, I don't think there is a, there should be a big debate uh, regarding the answer to this question. I think for the sake of European security, uh, the geography, the economy, and also the political argument is that we will all be better off if we make the region European. Now, this doesn't happen overnight. And if we all join Europe today, tomorrow we will still have the same issues. So what we need is a process that transforms, that works. And this is supposedly what the accession process should be about. It's, it's a coaching exercise with impartial objective reporting of the commission. Um, and throughout months and years of reforms, countries become European, their economies become stronger. Uh, there is another argument uh, that works against um, the European perspective of the region, and this is the internal functioning of the European Union. And I think these days, as we witness the issues, uh, the struggle for consensus on 1.8 plus trillion euros, so there are 1.8 trillion arguments in favor of reaching this goal, having a consensus in Europe on the relief fund, which is desperately needed in many countries in the midst of this COVID-19 pandemic, the multi-annual financial framework, the budget. Um, I think these two uh, are complementary and they're not confrontational, mutually exclusive goals. It is obvious that the European Union has issues without the region when it comes to decision-making. And I think uh, we in Europe, both citizens of member states and, and candidate countries, we Europeans, we have to face those problems honestly and realistically. And this is the debate on the future of the European Union. And it is obvious that the decision-making process needs an improvement. But this does not mean that we have the luxury of not engaging with a region that is geographically part of us, politically, in many ways, culturally, and economically. My own country is a rather drastic example um, of uh, issues with the accession process, of vetoes, of bilateralization, of a process that should bring Europe here. Uh, we've been a, a candidate country for 15 years. We are the first country that signed the Association and Stabilization Agreement, even before Croatia. And we've witnessed many vetoes. I've lost count. First, it was uh, about the name dispute with Greece. It took many years and we managed to resolve it by uh, making sure that our Macedonian identity, our Macedonian language is not touched with the PRESPA agreement. Then we faced this debate on the internal functioning and uh, bringing the house in order before we get more inhabitants, which was mostly a debate initiated by France. We have a new methodology and we have a reformed accession process. Uh, there is more strictness and there is reversibility. If a country goes backwards, the process goes backwards. For the people of the region, uh, this is not bad news because we have a process in place uh, in order to move forward. It's not simply a formal 
uh, opening of chapters, a formal exercise of keeping up pretenses. This is a process that should bring changes in, 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 in the reality on the ground. Now, part of the methodology says that the process will be more merit-based, more performance-based, more objective, with more clear tasks and roadmaps and targets in the political criteria, in the economic criteria, etc. And that all parties will abstain from, from misusing outstanding issues in the accession process. Now, this is not exactly what took place uh, two days ago at this virtual General Affairs Council, because uh, another neighbor, our Eastern neighbor this time, Bulgaria, decided not to join the consensus to start accession talks with uh, North Macedonia, even though there is a clean green light, a political decision without conditions attached in March this year of the European Council, using as a pretext conditions related to our Macedonian language, our Macedonian identity and our history. Now, um, uh, all these are very much internal. They're part of uh, our right of self-determination. And it is really difficult for me, as someone who invested so much, the whole government, in resolving problems, in making a very strong drive towards a liberal democracy, a U-turn to our predecessor, predecessors um, in the past. We had recently elections. The issue number one, the most pressing concern for the voters, for the Macedonian citizens, was rule of law and accountability of politicians. The second one was COVID-19, and the third one was the economic standards, jobs, and, and salaries. This is telling uh, this is telling in terms of to what extent our society is ready to enter this process. There is thirst and hunger to become European if European still means uh, a functional democracy governed by the rule of law and a hope for prosperity. So it's difficult to explain why our Macedonian language should be an obstacle to getting closer to a union that in Article 3 of the Lisbon Treaty has an obligation to respect uh, the rich cultural and linguistic diversity. And to a union that has in Article 8 of the Lisbon Treaty an obligation to establish a special partnership with its neighbors, with its neighborhood, on the basis of these European values. So what is Europe, and I'm ending with this, what is Europe from the perspective of the Western Balkans? There are two magnets. One, there is hope for prosperity, which comes with uh, the common market. And two, uh, the magnet of the community of values. Europe is a community of values. When you say, when you uh, use the adjective European in our region, usually the association is decency, normalcy, rules, free media, independent judges, fight against corruption, hold politicians accountable, clean air, breathable air, clean waters, uh, economic development. These are the associations. And this is why I think for both those inside the European Union and outside the European Union, whenever we make compromises that uh, undermine the second magnet, the principles, the standards, the values of the European Union, Europe is less attractive and the European Union is weaker. Uh, the political fights that we see in Europe in the EU, beyond the EU, but also globally, are not too uh, different. And I think whether we are member states or we are candidates, 
we have to support those who fight for values and we have to unite because on the other side we see populism uh, uh, those who promote illiberal uh, democracies they also cooperate and whenever uh, let's say the world of liberal democracies loses this is a loss for for all of us i'll end up here i hope that i was able at least to some extent to put a spotlight on why this process is important. We will never give up to make our country European. If we have access to the accession process as a reform tool, great. If we don't, we're gonna to have to find a way to continue to reform and import European standards at home because this is our vision and our promise to the next generation. Thank you for, for the attention. And I'm open to any questions now in an exchange. Thank you so much. There's a, a, a lot of questions in the chat box, uh, but allow me first to have a, sort of the first question. And it's something that you touched upon uh, in terms of uh, the negotiations uh, for uh, two days ago. And uh, so one of the problems that we are, we are sort of saying, you know, it's um, in, in, in the EU or in, in Denmark, you know, do we really want these states? Are they democratic enough? And, and we, but what happens when you have a state capture within the EU, for example, that state capture is not something that only takes place outside of the EU and that actually also endangers, you could say, the, uh, the, the whole process of, of putting Europe together. Um, so what are your thoughts about that? How can we actually, um, and, and, and when Danes look at countries in the EU who are in some degree subject to state capture and say, okay, we are afraid of letting these new countries in that will have the same problem. What is then your answer to that? Uh, this is an argument I hear often uh, especially in some European capitals. I lived for many years in the Netherlands, in The Hague, and this is a big debate in the Tweede Kamer, in the Dutch uh, Parliament as well. I think um, the lesson that we have learned in the last years is that the fight for democracy and rule of law doesn't stop. And once you join the union, this doesn't mean that you can say, okay, we are done. Uh, and the only uh, sustainable solution to this is a mechanism of the European Union. And I think there is an ongoing debate and there is some progress made on that. Uh, this is actually part of the reason why we don't have a consensus on the 1.8 trillion uh, euros is that there should be also an internal mechanism for the country, for, for member states that will make sure that uh, everyone is committed and subscribes to the set of values and principles that make us European. Uh, I, I think this will be a long, lengthy process. I think this will be a very difficult process, but it, this is a process that has already started. Uh, and um, it will be very short-sighted if you face an issue of this nature within, not to support a drive for those values uh, in a country that is in your front yard, so to speak. So I think what we need to do is we need to be open, we need to um, uh, be honest, and whenever there is hope for progress, this should be supported, and whenever there is backsliding and state capture, this should be boldly state named that changed, so to speak. So I think this is the, the formula that will move the whole continent forward. Um, but the, I think the instinct in these last years in many European countries has been looking inward. 
but looking inward in, in a, such a globalized world. And we saw that with the Syria war. In many uh, European capitals, the Syrian war was seen as something that is far away. I think this is probably the, the biggest defeat of our civilization in our times. But then uh, the, the war came to Europe through uh, the challenges of migration. And there is a lesson here. You cannot be safe if you only think of yourself. And if you only look, my borders are safe, you know. So I think we have to step up and we very much welcome the geopolitical ambition of the new uh, European Commission. Uh, Europe cannot be safe if it does not assume its responsibilities uh, worldwide. And this means more engagement, not less engagement. Thank you. So uh, Dukagin Abduli has a lot of questions. I will pick one of his questions uh, because I don't think we have time for all of them. Um, but uh, his first question is, does the EU have a specific timeline towards achieving a legally binding agreement for normalization between Kosovo and Serbia? Would you know this? Yes, we are neighbors to both, uh, Serbia and Kosovo. They're, well, uh, this is one of the big unresolved issues in the Balkans. Uh, I don't think there is a legal timeline. Um, I think in the recent months we have witnessed more engagement and there is now uh, a special envoy tasked to uh, help facilitate the resolution of this dispute. Uh, Miro Lajcak, the former foreign minister of Slovakia, but uh, I would be wary of putting a timeline, a deadline um, out there for this. I think it's more important to have a good solution. It's, import it's more important to have a solution that will uh, be supported politically in both countries. Um, so the short answer is no, there is no timeline. Okay. Uh <laughs> And I apologize to Dukakin Abduli because you really have a lot of questions, but I'll take the next question uh, is from Vladimir Lane. So dear De Mr. Dimitrov, do you think that European minister uh, GAC have to dec decouple North Macedonia from Albania and judge them separately? So do you think that there should be a separate process? Uh, and which countries were against Albania and what are the conditions that are asked to fulfill the first uh, IC, I, IGC and which conditions has to fulfill for your country? Um, why did your prime minister, prime minister resign and Albanian's prime minister didn't? So that's a lot of questions in one uh, <laughs> sentence. Uh, but I guess if you just uh, think uh, of the first question, is there, should there be separate processes for for Northern Macedonia and uh, and Albania in the uh, in with regards to the EU, um, we have uh, helped each other uh, in in the political phase. Let's say when that ended in March, where both countries uh, received green lights. In our case, in the operative paragraph of the council conclusions, we don't have additional preconditions attached to be able to start the process and have the first intergovernmental conference. In the case of our good neighbors uh, from Albania, there, there have been conditions attached. And there is a debate currently among member states to what extent these preconditions have been fulfilled. Um, politically, as neighbors, we have an interest to help each other. And if our success helps Albania or if the Albanian success helps North Macedonia, great. But it is frankly difficult to reconcile the concept of a process that is merit-based 
with uh, making progress of one country, country A, contingent of, on progress of a country B. This defeats the, the, the merit-based approach of the process. So I think now uh, we, we see uh, Serbia in the accession talks, Montenegro in the accession talks. If we make a political connection, uh, I think we make it very difficult for countries to progress if there is no incentive that it is in your hands. So if you uh, have a stellar pro obvious progress uh, ahead, let's say in one year, one reporting period, I think this should be recognized and rewarded. And this is how the process, the process works. Um, we'll see what happens. I wish best of success also to our friends from, from Albania. And uh, on the resignation, I think I should not go in, in uh, the direction of this answering to that. Our Prime Minister last fall, after the no at the October summit, decided to go back to the people and ask them, uh, do you still think that we need to go in the direction that we think, which is Europe? And we won those early elections, so we, we now have a fresh mandate for the people to move in that direction. This was the reasoning on our side. Thank you. Um, then we have a question from Hans Lund Andersen, uh, a Dane. Why don't the Western Balkans just make themselves democratic as the West Europe, and then you can seek membership of the EU? It doesn't work the other way around. It's, uh, I, I, I don't argue that the Western Balkans should become, should join the EU uh, uh, not ready. We have a process. We have a process that is now very long, very lengthy. Uh, in the case of the Baltics, in the case of the Central Europeans, it took several years. In the case of Croatia, it was seven years. Now we have a country that is in the talks for eight years and the end is uh, not really easily recognizable. We can't see it from where we are. So um, uh, what I argue for is engagement uh, and assistance that will make both the member states and the candidate countries better off. We will do everything that we can also on our own. We have friendly and benevolent friendly states that will help us. The accession process is there to uh, make sure that the region is peaceful, stable and moves towards Europe in terms of values, standards, and the AKI, adoption of, of the AKI. But not engagement will hurt also member states. And this was, this is what I tried to um, explain and argue for in my uh, introduction. Great, we have time for one last question. And that is from the honorary consul of, um, for Albania, Albania here in Denmark. His name is Hans Geo Nielsen. And uh, he's asked, what is needed to have Bulgaria to change its attitude? Um, this is the question for me <laughs> these days. Um, we will not give up. At the moment, we are still, um, there is a channel of talks, bilateral between Skopje and Sofia. We are committed to finding a way out, but in the framework of what's doable and what's not doable. Um, uh, we, our language is Macedonian. This is our right of self-determination. This is res a result of a historical process. This is not something that politicians can talk about or negotiate about. So uh, some of the other concerns, non-interference in internal affairs, uh, the implementation of the friendship treaty, we are fully committed and we are working on that. So I think 
uh, friendship with Bulgaria. And frankly, it's not very good neighborly if, let's say, a neighbor of Denmark questions whether Danish is a language or not. Uh, uh, and I think our language really cannot be an obstacle to friendship if that friendship is based on mutual uh, respect. So I think our goal to move forward on the European agenda, our goal to uh, invest in the friendship with Bulgaria, and our goal, our duty to protect who we are, our identity, are three complementary goals. And we will continue to convince our friends in Sofia that uh, this is the case. At the same time, um, uh, we have to take into account that if we made history a uh, full alignment on one history, a precondition for the European Union, I don't think we would have had the European Union. In many European countries, there are different views on historical figures, on historical events, and we live to uh, and we learn to live with those differences. So, and I think this is the European way. And I really don't think that it's wise for, histo for history to become a subject of debate between politicians. We need to leave that to historians because we can't change history, we can change today and tomorrow. Thank you so much, Nuka. That's a, a good end. We can't change history, but we can change day and uh, today and tomorrow. So uh, thank you for joining us and uh, I hope to see you maybe in a year's time in, in, in Copenhagen to another event of this sort. But to in the region. Yeah. Invite you to the region. I'd love to do that as well. So thank you so much. I apologize for not, there were so many questions, but um, maybe you'll have the opportunity to answer them later on.